All right, so is everybody having a great Howard day? Yeah! <laughs> All right. We're going to be doing something a little bit different today. This is something new for Howard Days. Uh, this is the first, hopefully annual, Glenn Lord Symposium. We're going to have a series of academic papers here at Howard Days. Uh, this is something that uh, some of us have been working on uh, very hard over the last five, six, seven, eight years, and that's to try and get Robert E. Howard's work uh, more recognition in academic circles and literary criticism circles. Um, starting, I guess it was 2004, was that the probably one of the first years we had uh, some Howard people that went to the Popular Culture Association National Conference, which is... Uh, that's the really big academic conference for pop culture studies. And um, sporadically over the years, uh, people have gone back and given papers. Uh, beginning in around 2009, 2010, um, an uh, English professor named Justin Everett, uh, and he started uh, the Pulp Studies area at uh, PCA, at the Popular Culture Association Conference. Um, a couple of years later, I became his uh, co-chair uh, for the Pulp Studies area, and we've been sort of building that up over the years. Uh, the last couple of years, I've started going to the uh, International Conference for the Fantastic and the Arts, which is the big academic conference for science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Uh, and this year, we had uh, you know, several of my, my colleagues and friends came and, and joined us and gave papers. So we've been doing a lot of work over the last few years to really get Howard out there and uh, you know not just at fan conventions uh, but in academic conferences as well and getting uh, publishing going uh, for those who don't know we do have a peer-reviewed journal of Howard studies the dark man that's in LA listed and so things are really starting to take off now on the academic front and so what I wanted to do is give all of you fans here a taste of what we've been doing you know so you know, often you know, people think of academia as this sort of ivory tower kind of thing, and we don't really know what they're doing, and it's kind of weird and whatever. But uh, there's actually some just amazing stuff being done, and it, you know, people tend to think that this ah, kind of takes the fun out of it if you overanalyze things. But in a lot of ways, what it really does is, it, at least for me, it helps me understand better what Howard was doing with his work and where he was coming from, and that actually makes me enjoy it so much more when I can kind of get into his head a little bit and see what it was he was doing. Uh, and so we're going to get a bit of a taste of that today. Uh, we've got some uh, really, really interesting papers. These are uh, papers that were given at, uh, at the PCA conference, at the ICFA conference. Um, we'll probably speed them up a little bit here just for time references and, yes. and, and whatnot. But just to give you a little bit of flavor of what we've been doing on the academic front over the last few years. So we're going to start out with Dr. Jonas Prita. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the volume Conan Meets the Academy. Uh, Jonas uh, edited this volume uh, for McFarlane in 2012, I believe. Is that right? And um, you know, I had a chapter in that. Dan Luke is going to be presenting later. Had a chapter in that. Um, he's the vice president now. Yeah. At uh, how does it? Wow, I don't know. Name? Yeah, nobody wants the job. <laughs> the vice president at uh, the College of Saint Joseph in Rutland, Vermont. Uh, English professor up there as well. Yes. So he's going to give us his, his paper on Breckenridge Elkins. That should be good. Okay. All right. Yep. Uh, am, am I audible there at the back? Can everybody hear me? All right. Good. Because uh, I can be louder. And I think, am I really mic'd up? Already? Okay. Uh, I don't think I need one because I'll just project. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I did the Robert Howard entry for the American Writer Series. Um, before that, I did H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. So I spent a lot of my time in, in sort of the weird tales space. Uh, right now, I'm getting to do it on uh, Edgar Allan Poe, which is pretty awesome. But for this one, I, I decided to look a little bit at Breckenridge Elkins uh, and that character. Uh, and so that fits in very well with the conversation we just had. And I wanted to look back a little bit at, it's not people that Howard was reading, but just the tradition that his tales are sort of growing out of. Uh, so as, as all of you, or probably most of you know, Elkins, who appears in 26 Howard stories, is probably the most successful character if we go by how many times the person shows up. Right, and that, and it's in a bunch of those action stories. And Mark Finn makes the excellent argument that this is probably the closest thing we have to Howard's actual like voice, is is in these sort of tall tales that he does. Uh, and and one of the arguments I make is that Elkins continues the tradition of local color and local humor. 
that, that kind of gets its start in America in the antebellum period, so pre-Civil War, especially in the Old South. Uh, which wasn't supposed to be this slide. Sorry, that was a dramatic pause for no reason. And so we, we have this stuff in Elkins, um, right, where, where it's, this, it's this very bizarre form of dialect. It's not bizarre. It's, it's actual dialect, right? And as you read it, once you read it for 10 minutes, you can kind of figure out what they're actually saying. Uh, and it has this, this fun combination of, of dialect with uh, sort of over-the-top violence that I, that I find very interesting. Um, I'm a huge fan of Itchy and Scratchy from The Simpsons, which I think is the next step of this stuff. Now we can do something with it. So the Old Southwest, right? This is the first uh, Old West of, of the, the beginning of America. So it's Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, and Tennessee. Right here on the map, it's this area, right? Part of this uh, is in Texas. And this is... First frontier after the Revolutionary War, it attracts a certain type of settler. These settlers who are very similar to the ones who come to Texas during the oil boom, right? People who are, you know, drifters, or you couldn't make it back where you went, so you go to some place where nobody knows who you are, and you try to start a new life. Uh, these areas develop a certain kind of popular culture and writing, where we have a lot of fighting, right? This, this will be of no surprise to anybody who reads Robert Howard. Uh, horse racing, you drink a lot, right? And these things that are about like these hyper-masculine feats because you're, it's this interesting combination where you're trying to both show what the popular culture is like, but you're also trying to make an argument for the readers, oftentimes who live somewhere else, about what's going on in, in this case, Georgia or Louisiana, wherever it is. So our first one that we'll look at is Augustus Baldwin Longstreet with Georgia scenes. This is from 1835. Um, born in Georgia, educated in Yale, comes back to Georgia, right? He's the president of Emory at some point. So he's, he's, uh, he's hyper-educated for the period, but he writes about very interesting popular culture, working people um, fighting, largely. His most famous piece is The Fight which resembles many uh, Elkins tussle. And it begins with this, and, and, and you'll, you'll know this stuff directly, right? It was in the younger days of the Republic there lived in the county of, you know, don't want to fill it in, two men who were admitted on all hands to be the very best men in the country, which in Georgia vocabulary meant they could flog any other two men in the, in the county, right? So it's just like, these are two guys, they're going to fight each other. Bob and Billy are their names, right? We can turn this around and become Billy Bob, a later Southern stereotype. Um, so Bob is one type of fighter, right? He wants to sort of like wrestle you to the ground. Uh, and the other one is Billy, and his deal is that he can punch you. So they, they, they talk awesome trash throughout much of this. Um, Billy only wanted one lick at him to knock out his heart, liver, and lights out. And if he got two, he'd knock him into a cocked hat. And then the lower battalion, the other one, is like, well, he wouldn't have time to double his fist where Bob would put his hair where his feet ought to be, and that by the time he hit the ground, the meat would fly off his face so quick that people would think it was shook off by the fall. So again, this is 1835. People are writing like, okay, let's have this crazy fight where meat flies everywhere. But they refuse to fight because they're friends. But ha-ha, someone enters the game, and that's Ramsey Sniffle. Uh, and then, you know, these two women who obviously are going to cause part of the problem, um, they get in a fight caused by Rancy, and again, unbelievable dialogue. Who, will, who do you call an impudent hussy, you nasty, good-for-nothing, snaggletooth gob of fat, you? So, you know, long tradition of that. Uh, and that's Rancy Snuffle. He's less pixelated probably in real life. Uh, that's actually from the, 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 the joke isn't, but the picture is. Uh, that was the same one. That was a screw-up on my part, sorry. Um, moving right along. So they fight, right? And, and it, the, it's the narrator talking about the fight. I looked and saw that Bob had entirely lost his left ear and a large piece of his, from his left cheek. His right eye was a little discolored, and the blood flowed profusely from one of his wounds. And then Bill, not much better. Hideous spectacle, about a third of his nose at the lower extremity was bit off, and his face so swelled and bruised it was difficult to discover in it anything of the human visage, much more than the fine features he carried into the ring. And so, again, it's, just, it's the standard knockdown battle literally here, right? A guy gets his finger bit off, and it falls through the hole in the side of his mouth, uh, and it, it's exactly what a person like me wants to read. Um, and so, you know, it ends like all good fights, and everybody sort of shakes hands, and then we get this really funny ending to it. Uh, Thanks to the Christian religion, to schools, colleges, and benevolent associations, such scenes of barbarism and cruelty as that which I have now just described are now of a rare occurrence, although they may 
still be occasionally met with some of the new counties. Wherever they prevail, they are a disgrace to that community. The peace officers who countenance them deserve a place in the penitentiary, right? And it's just like, and then the next chapter is a whole other set of these kinds of fights. <laughs> so th that, <laughs> that guy's awesome. So then we get another one, Johnson Jones Hooper, who's another one of these people writing the uh, antebellum period. Born in North Carolina, works as a lawyer in Alabama, uh, opens up a bunch of different newspapers. They all don't work, but that's the way things happen in antebellum America, is you just like serially open things that collapse, but it doesn't matter because you're a con man. Um, it's his most famous uh, work is Some Adventures of Captain Simon Suggs, later the Tallapoosa volunteered, one of my favorite lines in antebellum lit. His whole ethical system lies snugly in his favorite aphorism. It's good to be shifty in a new country. <laughs> Some things don't change, uh, which means that it's right and proper that one should live as merrily and as comfortably as possible at the expense of others. Uh, when, when, you, when you bought these, right, in the, sort of their version of Pulp Fiction, they almost always had these engravings to kind of give you an idea of like, here's Simon Suggs, this, this broken down con man who sort of operates at the frontier. Go ahead. Uh, he, uh, early on, you know, he fights with his dad, as all these guys seem to do. And, and this is his dad's comment to him. Simon, Simon, you poor and lettered fool. Don't you know that all card players and chicken fighters and horse races go to hell? You crack-brained creature, you. And don't you know that them that plays cards always loses their money? And who wins it all then, daddy? Asked Simon. Shut your mouth, you impudent slack-jawed dog. Your daddy's are trying to give you some good advice, and you're picking up his words that way. So uh, this, this sort of like literary combat that, that's about like word usage that ends up in a bunch of those Breckenridge stories, you see it in a lot of these as well. Uh, here's one where he plays a trick on his old mom um, by packing her pipe full of gunpowder. Uh, again, because it is good to be shifty in a new country. Go ahead. Uh, um, a, a, a quick one here. Reader! Dost thou ever encounter the tiger, not the bounding creature of the woods, with deadly fang and mutilating claw that preys upon blood and muscle, but the stealthier and more ferocious animal, which ranges amid the bitty haunts of men, which feeds upon coin and banknotes, whose spots, more attractive than those of its namesake of the forest, dazzle and lure, like a brilliantly varying hues of the charmer snake, the most intensely and irresistible, the longer they are looked at, the thing in short, of pasteboard and ivory, mother of pearl and mahogany, the Pharaoh Bank. All one sentence. Don't write that if you're in a comp class. <laughs> um, so again, Suggs doing his thing, right? He, he, the, the, the usual uh, Suggs adventure is he tries to pull a fast one, he gets caught, but there's always another frontier that you can go take advantage of. Conan, right? Minus the taking advantage of. Um, uh, not that Suggs was particularly fond of danger, albeit he is a hero, but because he delighted in the noise and confusion, the fun and free drinking incident to such occasions. Right, so he'll go around, it's like, oh, okay, there's, there's going to be an Indian war here. There's not really going to be a war, but I'll make like there's going to be one, and then I'll just take advantage of the situation. Um, in, in this one, he, they, uh, like the, the stupid widow, you know, thinks that there's actual Indians coming. She tries to jump over the fence and they shoot her. Uh, and <laughs> Funny, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm a going mighty fast, replied the widow as four stout men raised her from the ground and carried her into the house, where her wounds were demonstrated to consist of a contusion on the bump of the philoprogenitiveness and a loss of a half square inch of the corrugated integument of her left knee. So this idea that, again, we see in Elkins of like fancy pants language thrown into the narrative, which we have there. Uh, this is straight out of phrenology stuff, which is another thing that I love studying about, right? That's how you can tell you the bumps on your head and what you're going to turn into. So again, here's our picture of it. They're about to shoot the poor widow. Uh, and th so, as is usually the case, you find a preacher at some point, because uh, you know, a lot of camp revivals happening in this period. And so Suggs does what he usually does and tries to figure out a way to take advantage of the situation. And he asks this question. Wonder what's the reason that these here preachers never hugs up on the old ugly women? Never seed one dude in my life. That spirit never moves them that way. Nature will be nature all the world over. And I judge if I was a preacher, I should save the prettiest souls first myself. And then to move it even one more step into this linguistic apocalypse that, that we sort of run into that, that Elkins is part of, this is a letter he's writing to the narrator, right? Because it's all done as frame narrative. Um, Dear Johns, uh, Arter my compliments, etc. I sat down to write you a few lines 
consarin of them hoss papers, the captain alludes to the New York spirit of the times, you'd set me from the Nord, which I'm much obliged for the same, and you can tell the printer to keep ascending as long as he wants to, the pictures is great. It's sort of this phonetic corn pone. And then the last one, and, and I'll be done in like five minutes, probably less if I talk faster. The, the Southwest humorist that, that Howard's closest to is George Washington Harris, um, whose character Sut Lovingood is uh, really, it, it's a fun read if you can get through what it reads like. Um, it mixes this violence from Georgia scenes with the Simon Suggs linguistic apocalypse, which we'll see in some of the samples. Uh, George Washington Harris himself was born in Tennessee, or George, m born in Pennsylvania, moves to Tennessee, and he works as, and this was just a limited amount of him, right? Steamship captain, metal shop owner, copper mine, uh, submitted a bunch of these sketches, culminating in the Sut Love and Good stuff. He also works for the Con Confederate States of America. He's doing a bunch of stuff, and none of it really works that well, except for the Sut Love and Good stories. Uh, the natural born darn fool. Uh, the center of these comically violent adventures, usually involving some sort of authority figure that Sut wants to take advantage of. If you're in a position of power in these stories, it's going to go badly for you. Uh, Widow Miss Cloud's Mayor, and again, this is the, this is what the the writing of all of these is is like. And the door must have been nigh unto killed dead, for both of his hind legs were gone plumped up into his colpen and a string of innards coming out in the hole his legs bed let were a flutter at her him like a bolt a gray ribbon slapping again the saplings and stumps and getting longer every slap his paunch were a bobbin up and down about a foot whatever that is a uh hind -huh, thank you where the pine of his tail used to be so this is like a funny joke about a dog whose innards are falling out as the dog um, follows the widow on another path that Sut loving good has sent her down so again, ha ha, right? Cruelty towards animals is funny. Um, uh, the, probably the most famous, it, it's not, that, that was irony for the camera. I'm, I'm not really serious. Um, so Sut's dislike of authority in, comes up in this, uh, probably the most anthologized chapter, this Parson John Boland's Lizards. Um, he goes, to, again, he goes to the camp meeting and realizes that Parson John Boland's only talks to attractive women. So what do you do? Oh, you catch seven or eight lizards and you put them up the legs of the preacher while he's up there preaching. Uh, there are tails at the bottom and crowd them for room that they could run around. And so when he was a raven on his tiptoes and pounded on the pulpit with his fist, unbeknownst to everyone, I untied my bag of reptiles, put the mouth of it under the bottom of his breeches leg and sawed it into pinching our tails. And so they run up his legs and they get into his pants. And so the preacher eventually just like gets naked on stage and has to run through the crowd of 3,000 people. Uh, so Cicely Burns is one of his love interests, you'll, again, Breckenridge Elkin style. Um, just the discussion about her, right? Handsome, that our word can't cover the case. It sounds sort of like calling good whiskey strong water. When you're 10 miles from a still house, hit rain and your flask is only half full. She takes exactly 15 inches of garter, clear over the knot, stands 16 and a half hands high, and weighs 126 in her petticoat after breakfast. She couldn't crawl through a whiskey barrel with both heads stove out, nor sit in a Carmen armchair while you, could lock the, while you could lock the top hoop of a churn or a big door collar round the hugging place. So this is apparently the, the ultimate woman for Sut Love and Good in 1845. When explaining why he speaks like he does, right? Because again, he's talking to a narrator. It's all this sort of interesting frame narrative stuff. Um, that's it, by golly. Now, why the devil can't I explain myself like you? I ladles out my words at random, like a calf kicking at yellow jackets. You just rolls them out to the punt, like a fellow laying bricks, everyone fits. How is it that bricks fit so close anyhow? Rocks won't do it. And so it's this idea that almost looking back at himself, like I just have this torrent of words that fly out of me, and they don't always really fit together, but the story almost always does. Uh, so this, this is the last slide. Um, so Mrs. Yardley, another one of these people that he plays the tricks on and, you know, bad things happen. Uh, she's, she's setting up a quilting party because she's about to die. Gobblers, fiddles, gals, and whiskey were the words she sent to the men folk. And more tetching and waking words never draft often a woman's tongue. She said to the gals, sweet toddy, hugging, dancing, and huggers in abundance. Them words struck the gals right in the pit of the stomach and spread a tickling sensation both ways until they'd scratched their heads with one hand and their heels with the other. So, uh, 
one of the things that always strikes me as interesting about this stuff is this is from 1845, and that this is Nathaniel Hawthorne and Ralph Waldo Emerson in like, the American literary canon is going on there. And then in this whole other like popular culture world, this is what people are talking about. It's essentially setting up a big party where everybody can make out with each other. Do I have anything else? No, OK. Um, and I believe I am now both done with slides and time. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.